we are graced today with John Polanyi, Nobel Prize laureate, on our stage. Before he comes up to talk, I just wanted to read to you two small quotes that might give you a little bit of a measure of the man. John has said, a nation is more than a machine for creating wealth. And he's also said, science is the glory as well as the terror of mankind. John Polanyi. Well, lovely to be here. I was told I didn't have to prepare anything, I just would chat with you. And, uh, but uh, I didn't believe that, so I went to get a new pair of trousers. And <laughs> <coughs> it's all right, they weren't ready in time. These are the old ones. And the chap who sold me the trousers, which are now being shortened, said, I know who you are. You're John Polanyi, and you teach at the University of Toronto. And so I turned to him and said, you know, you're a marvel. Uh, you really do know things. And he said, all my life I've been collecting useless information. <laughs> some useless information for you. It is a fourth century vase, a goblet actually, not a vase. It's for drinking. And, but really, 1600 years old. <clears throat> On the vase, 1600 years ago, somebody engraved a god, a, a mythic god, Lysurgus, uh, who was renowned in Homeric times, so this is now centuries before Christ, for his filthy temper. And he attacked the uh, king Dionysus, and the king's handmaiden, Ambrosia, came to the defense of the god, Dionysus. What I wanted you to do was see something beautiful, and think of this depiction, 1600 years ago, of the image of power, which is to say, Lysurgus, the mythical king. This modern personification of power is what we're here to discuss, uh, science, and the power of science resides in knowledge. And the thought in our minds is, are we uh, calling on ourselves a rebuke from the gods uh, because we are trying to usurp their power? I don't think so for a moment. I think that the power of science uh, is usable for good and ill. That sounds uh, trite, but it is true. The mistakes that we make as scientists, and, and they are the thing that we that humbles us, we constantly make mistakes, uh, are corrected in print over our names, published in respectable journals under the title Erratum. Uh, and that's something neither Lysurgis nor his successors in political power would ever dream of doing. And it is part of the discipline, if you like, that uh, we accept from Ambrosia, uh, whose vines are wrapped around us. The implication which is embedded deep in science, is that it isn't just our experience which is valid, other people's experience is also valid, and we should pay attention to it. And it is on that sort of basis that all the human rights which underlie the civilization, such as we have, uh, is based. Other people are human, other people should be heard. A new pattern was found in 1959 by a scientist called Richard Feynman. Uh, and uh, he didn't call it this, but in fact, he had the idea of nanoscience. What did uh, Richard Feynman, a professor at Caltech, have to say? He said in 1959, uh, we're reaching the end of this atom smashing period. Uh, why don't we take atoms one at a time and build up from the bottom? And uh, the idea had real impact. But the odd thing, and it's worth paying attention to, is that 20 years passed before anybody had the glimmer of an idea how to push atoms around and assemble them one by one. 20 years later, a young scientist, he was playing around with a sharp metal tip, dragging it across the surface and the current from the tip to the surface was oscillating as he dragged the tip across. It occurred to him to compare the rate of oscillation of the current as he dragged the tip across the surface with the frequency with which the tip was encountering individual atoms at the surface. And my God, it matched. <clears throat> 
he was addressing, he was seeing individual atoms. And the nano age was really upon us because it became possible to manipulate individual atoms. Do you notice this changing color? Of course you do. The reason is that 1400 years ago, the seeds of nanoscience had been sown. These guys put into that goblet nanoparticles, and when you view the goblet in reflection, it's bright green. But if you shine light through, the little particles scatter the blue, and you see a red goblet. They thought that was marvelous, and they were right. And then, better part of 1,400 years passed <clears throat> before we really realized the potential of this nano sound. You are looking at, well, you're looking at a circle of 12 orange blodges, but they are, each of them is a bromine, a single bromine atom bound to an underlying silicon atom. They have self-assembled on the surface, actually millions of these circles have self-assembled, and then Jody took an ultraviolet laser, flashed it, and bang, she had this thing, which instead of existing only at 50 degrees Kelvin, which is very cold, can be heated in an oven to 250 degrees centigrade and nothing moved. This is a printing press, a mask-free printing press for molecular scale patterns. My time is up, so I just want to make it finally on a philosophical basis. And for that, I can go back to my favorite vase. The fact is that we live in an intertwined world, as every one of you knows. The building of walls to protect ourselves against the enemy is not a starter. It's not going to work. And uh, <clears throat> the enemy, what is the enemy? I mean, it is ignorance, uh, intolerance, and, but beneath that, it is want and deprivation. You don't wall yourself off from those things. You do what this uh, design on the vase is showing. Uh, you have to embrace. And uh, so uh, fill up the uh, goblet and let's all share a drink. Thank you very much.